right now. Um, we're, we're pleased to have you with us. We're pleased also to have our panelists with us, and I want to thank you all for taking time from your busy schedules to be here today. Let me introduce the panelists to you. Um, let me start with the person who is most immediately to my right, and that is Mark Pitchford. Um, one of our graduates, Mark is the CO, COO of Cool LLP, one of the large law firms that is has an office here in Palo Alto and also several locations scattered um, throughout the country and also foreign uh, jurisdictions as well. Then sitting next to him is Catherine Andrews, who is an attorney at Thoits, Love, Hirschberger and McLean, located in Palo Alto, California. Um, she does, she has a corporate transactional practice there, and when I asked her how the firm characterized itself, it's, you know, it's one of those things, it's in the eye of the shoulder, small to mid-sized regional firm with their offices here locally. And then sitting next to her is Steve Gomez, who's a principal at Element Professionals, it's a legal staffing recruiting agency. I'm going to take just a moment to show you a few PowerPoint slides just to provide a context of where we've been and where we are. Um, the first one provides a summary of the history that is fairly recent, beginning in 2007, with the fact that, I hope that's not me in my PowerPoint slide, and um, Sandra, could you go over to Law IT and see if we could get the beeping to go away? Um, but we'll go on in the meantime. So in 2007, those of us that were in career services in 2007 and those students that were students in 2007 can remember some pretty good times. It was a strong seller's market. It was, we had a lot of firms coming from campus interviewing. And as I remember it, it was a good time to be in career services. In 2008, literally, while we were having on-campus interviews, there was a Sunday evening where there was a news report that came on, and the lady said, we're going to tell you about the collapse of Lehman Brothers and the fact that AIG is collapsing in three days. And um, it was during on-campus interviewing that the stock market had its big decline, in fact, the IRS was here that day. Um, again, it was one of those memories that I had. And by the end of 2008, we saw deferrals with many of them protracted, leading into uh, young attorneys being told, you know what, I don't think we need you to come. Some of them just taking a year off and doing various things. And it was the start of what became, I like this end of the world mentality. Um, in 2009, that continued in terms of there was an awful lot of retrenchment, um, redeployment of workforce, cutting of workforce. I'm sure all of us can remember that. And in 2010, we felt like we hit that bottom of the U-shaped curve where we weren't getting better, but we at least weren't getting worse. There was some stability in that. And then by 2011, we saw some increase in demand, and I liked what you said, moving at a glacial pace to you. Um, a little bit sluggish, but there was a feeling that things are, there were just some green shoots going out there in the economy, and in 2012, we're still in this slow growth mode. The question is, is what's going to happen next, and where do we go from here? Okay, before we talk about the longer term shifts in the market, and hopefully that took care of that horrible beeping sound. Um, this is a, this is, as you can see, the source is Thomson Reuters, and this comes from um, Legal Management Resources. This is a graph that shows you a five-year pattern for demand for legal services. So this is clients demanding legal services of our service providers, people like Mark, his firm, Catherine, her firm. And you can see where the credit crisis occurred, you can see what kind of decline happened, and you can see where there's currently a little upward shift on that. And then, as I mentioned, the question is, well, what does this mean in the longer term market shifts? 
And again, this is from Legal Management Resources where they say, at least in the foreseeable future, that when they talk about buyer's market, they're not talking buyer's market for you as candidates. They're talking buyer's market for clients. That for clients, it's a buyer's market for legal services. And it requires this paradigm shift in the mindset of law firm leaders that they need to think about efficiency, cost-effectiveness, and the delivery of those legal services, and that it's going to be a more competitive market for them for the foreseeable future. And this is talking here about, in a limited market, when they're talking about one firm wins if another loses, and that stealing market share becomes essential. So we're going to find out from the people who are here whether or not they believe that this is true and what this all means for you. So my question for the panel, my first question for the panel is, is that when we, when we look at these slides, and you and I saw a whole host of slides that went beyond those three, they really talk about market forces that are affecting the manner in which you're structuring your practice in order to meet client demands. And I'm hoping that you could shed some insight a little bit on what some of those market forces are and how they're influencing how you're structuring your practice and deploying staff as a result. And Mark, why don't we start with you talking from the perspective of someone at a large law firm? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the two biggest ones are, are rate pressure and, and efficiency, which to some extent go hand in hand. So you've got, they're, they're, it's the, it would be the exceptional client who probably doesn't start out a new engagement or a, an engagement of the firm talking about rates and what sort of discount we can get, or can we talk about some sort of some sort of um, uh, fee where there's certainty? And, and it's not so much the fact that they're not prepared to pay whatever the cost of the service is, but it's more about certainty, so that these these business units of a large company can report up the chain to say I've met my budget. And so we've got to work we've got to work within that within that uh, uh, sort of. Uh, ecosystem to come up with a combination of rates and and lawyers of, of the right levels of, of seniority and, and uh, expertise to match that. So uh, it, efficiency is huge and I think that um, expertise, maybe using that word a little bit broadly, but, but for, for your purposes I think the ability to come to firms like ours with some level of expertise in a given area allows us to uh, effectively utilize you sooner. Uh, I'm aware of a few clients that won't use first years. I don't think that's a huge problem, but but if we're going to use younger lawyers, we've got to be able to use them effectively and, and avoid significant write-offs because the billing rates at a firm like ours, even at that level, are extremely high. So I think I think rate pressure, which then dovetails into the whole efficiency, would be probably two of the biggest. What do you see on the smaller firm side, Catherine? Well, I agree with what uh, Mark said. I'd also say that um, we use a lot of technology. And um, that sounds trite and possibly obvious. It's not that way in law firms. Um, <laughs> it's, it's different than your world. The law firms just tend to be behind um, the business world in that department. So it's, it's kind of a lot when a law firm, especially a small law firm, starts integrating uh, a lot of technology. Um, one thing it's expensive, not just to, to implement it, but to train people on it. But we use a lot of technology um, because it's more efficient and also because we can connect more with our business clients and appear and actually be, you know, um, more uh, active, I guess you'd say, and connected to the business world. And then the impact of that is that we need our staff to be more savvy um, and more diverse. So in a smaller firm, you need to be a little bit more scrappy. You need to be able to handle what comes in the door, and if you're slow in your department, be able to fill in in another department. Um, so we have a lot of diverse people, whether that's uh, what we now call desk managers, what we used to call secretaries, you know, a lot of secretary slash paralegal slash receptionist um, and associates that are slash business, slash business litigation, slash trademark um, type of thing. See, beyond smaller class sizes and smaller groups of people going in in these entry-level first-year associate roles at larger law firms, 
what are some of the other impacts you're seeing with regard to recruiting? Well, well my company is basically a service provider for law firms and corporate legal departments. Um, so I think what you see uh, from my point of view is kind of um, the, the demand for uh, alternative fees from, from the client companies and the, the, the corporate legal departments um, that the other panelists are feeling. It kind of rolls downhill to someone like myself where, you know, when I started doing this uh, a decade ago, um, a firm would come to me and say, we're looking for this, we have some of our own recruiting going on, but uh, you can help us out with these positions. There wasn't a lot of haggling over what our fees would be now. You know, we're being asked to um, come up with uh, alternative fee arrangements of our own for our searches. Um, we also do temp placements. We've seen quite downward pressure on our rates as well. Um, I think that what we're seeing more as a result of that is that firms come to us for very hard searches, people with very specific backgrounds. Some place like Silicon Valley, we get a lot of demand for uh, people with um, hard science backgrounds on the undergrad side. Um, sometimes we're getting um, demand for people with bio backgrounds. Um, so you're seeing that our searches get a little bit harder. It's not just I'm finding someone who's bright and motivated and wants to work hard. I mean, they have to have all of those things, but um, it really helps if they have some kind of specialized knowledge too. Perhaps they had a career before they even went to law school or they're bringing that to bear as a candidate too. Well, can you talk a little bit about larger law firms and how you're now looking at the structure within those? There's been a lot written about the deployment of staff that there's not just a partnership track anymore. There's also a number of attorneys working in other capacities as well. Can you talk a little bit yeah, about we, that? We, we haven't gone the route of, of sort of the staff. I know some firms just refer to, I think, as discovery attorneys where, where on the, as you enter, there's, there's essentially an understanding that I'm not, I'm not buying all the way in for the brass ring. I'm going to come in, I'm going to work hard, I, I might limit the amount of time I want to spend. I don't know if there's any upper limits on my compensation, but I'm going to protect to some extent the other, the other part of my life that I can achieve balance in. Um, we, we just simply haven't gone that route. Uh, we, we like. I'm not saying the other's wrong, but, but we want everybody coming in thinking, okay, I'm. I'm in, I'm in all in the day I get here. I may decide as, as we go along, and that's probably where we would then, we would then start to think about, well, is somebody prepared to, to go, in effect, off track, but yet is a very uh, productive, efficient, specialized worker. We don't, what we don't want to do is fill ranks of what we would call our business litigation or our general corporate <coughs> with, with too many career associates, if you will, because there, you get blocking issues. And, and there's a comfort level, certainly, for the partner to say, well, I've worked with this associate for seven, eight years. I know exactly what I'm going to get every time I ask. It's going to be two and a half days. It's going to be just fine. I may have to do a little of that. I'm good with that. Well, that's all well and good, but, but we're trying to each year recruit a generation of lawyers that's better than the one we recruited the year before. And with that has to become some initiative, some motivation, that drive to want to to want to make partner. And, and look, if you get three or four years in and you decide that's not for me, we totally understand that. But we've chosen not to distinguish on the front end. Mm -hmm. And can you talk a little bit about, there's some firms that have done that and they've become very notable for setting up centers in places like Wheeling, West Virginia. Right, or Akron, um, Ohio. Or, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about why they've done that? Well, I think I, I think a lot of it is is cost containment. You know, you you go, I, it work is obviously the firm in Wheeling. Uh, I think they struck a very interesting and attractive economic deal. Uh, bought a big old warehouse and probably got you know some tax and other related credits mm -hmm. to be there. And they're they're finding that they can attract. Look, there's bright people all over this country, and and they can attract local people at lower rates to do back office accounting, uh, business information systems, conflicts. I think they do staff it with with some uh, career staff research and writing sort of type attorneys. They probably put a lot of their discovery there. Again, we've, we've made the decision that at 650 lawyers, we're probably not quite at the scale where we need to do that. And the same thing goes for being overseas. We don't need to outsource yet is our view. But, but look, there's a method to the madness to be sure. And one thing that's clear now, all the pundits and the, and, and, you know, the, the Thompson data, the, the Wells data will tell you that right now what's happening is the expenses are rising faster than revenue in our in our world. And that's that was a key indicator in 01 and in 08 when this thing was going to turn upside down. So cost containment is huge in our, in our world. 
there's only, again, there's only so many levers you can you can do. We're not going to go out and lower salaries to begin, right? I mean, we would might as well shut down recruiting. So you've got to find efficiency somewhere. And Catherine, we had this discussion in preparation for the, today's presentation about the impact on small firms. Are small firms also seeing this? You talked about the data, that the data shows that expenses are rising. Um, are you seeing that also on the small firm side? Oh, definitely. Definitely. Our fees are, are pretty much capped. Um, our rates, I mean, we can't, because if you're a partner in a small firm or even in a large firm, you just can't continually raise. You know, your, your period for raising your rate is like years one through ten or something, and then you kind of you kind of tap out. Um, so we have to hold there. I would say it's um, pretty much the same, if not possibly more of a squeeze at a smaller firm. I have worked at large firms as well. I worked at Nixon Peabody and I've worked at four small firms. So um, there's definitely um, a need to compete. There is a there is a market for small firms and there's a market for large firms in terms of what clients are looking for without a doubt. And there's uh, I feel like more um, reciprocity between firms small and large than there is competition because um, you know my, our firm's competition is other small firms, not not large firms. But at the same time, most of them. But at the same time, um, we just have to be um, more efficient. And I would add a lot of industry expertise is so helpful <coughs> to, to underscore what you were saying, Steve, because um, we've got to be able to connect with the clients. And so if somebody has a medical background or a business background or accounting background, they have just a big sell in terms of bringing the client in and being able to speak their language and add value and get up to speed. And it may be something that's able to attract that client to us over a competitor. So Steve, let's say that all of a sudden the economy got miraculously better and things were just booming. It started to look like 2007 again, overnight, which uh, in career services anyway, we'd start celebrating. But, but what does that mean in terms of legal recruiting? Do we go back to where we were in 2007? Or has a fundamental paradigm shift occurred for candidates and these law firms and how they're, what they're now looking for as a candidate? No, I think it's changed forever. I think that even in the economy, we'll get good again. And I think that you're going to see that these types of uh, fee pressures, building pressures, are going to stay. I came out of law school 15 years ago, and I worked for an insurance defense firm. And you know, serving insurance companies was just like some of the things that the panelists are talking about. You know, back then, you know, the insurance companies would cut our bills for almost everything. They, we could only bill certain amounts for certain types of uh, documents or certain types <coughs> of, of litigation. Um, and so I think what you're seeing is the rest of the industry just you know, getting hit with that kind of cost sensitivity. So I don't think that from um, a standpoint of a recruiter that suddenly, you know, salaries are going to skyrocket again like they did from the mid-90s to, you know, for like six or seven years after that. Um, you're going to see everybody, um, <coughs> and it's, it's not just the legal profession, you've seen the same types of uh, business pressures hit uh, medicine and other professions that were once kind of isolated from you know, the typical economics because they're professions. You know, we have a job to do and it's very important and we need compensated for that. Now um, every profession is just every other business. So this fundamental paradigm shift, we've talked about the clients wanting more efficiency, that you need to be more efficient, that you need to have staff that can efficiently handle the matter. What does that mean for people in law schools? What does that mean if you are currently a first or a second or a third year student in terms of the skills that you need to be obtaining now in order to be someone who's going to be employable both presently and in the future as well. And um, Mark, what, do you, what are you Yeah, so, so I, I guess I would start by saying it's, it, it, may be, it may be somewhat grim right now, but, but we're hiring. I mean, firms are hiring. I mean, we, we had a summer program of 47. We're going to increase that to give or take 55 uh, for next summer. So we're, we're going to increase by 15 or 20 percent. You always need good people. And, and I think there's there's certainly more turnover these days with, with, you know, from existing lawyers. We, unfortunately, our biggest competitors are our best clients. So we do them a favor by training them, and then we lose them. Now, that's a win-win on many levels, but, but there's always a need to restock. And as I say, we're, 
Our, our motto is, as a professional services business, if you're not getting more better talent every year, you're falling behind. So now that said, are the numbers down a little bit? Yes, but but they're still hiring. So I don't want to be, I don't want to create and, and, and paint a, you know, just a, a, a totally bleak picture. That said, I think that, that as I as I talked about a little bit earlier, I think the more you the more you really focus on what what you want to do and begin to then mold your curriculum around that. Now you can't do a whole lot in the first year other than to do really well. You know, the more the, the better you do in the fundamentals, and because I was awful at contracts, I always look at the contracts grade to see how you did. Um, <laughs> but but you, you you know again, I'm not saying you should all want to work for a firm like Cooley and and Deutsch is a great firm. There's lots of things. There's lots of great firms, but. Fundamentally, we're going to look at that first year uh, performance. That'll determine a lot how you do in terms of second year OCI. And then I think, as I'm talking with, with, with Taylor and Sarah about, the ability to then come back and, and really begin to mold that curriculum. And I think you're in a good, a good place here because you, you're in a valley that, that the school takes advantage of where it is. And, and whether it be seminars or clinical programs, you can get so much practical experience here and, and really learn from practitioners. The more you, the, to Steve's point, the more I can look at a resume and say whether it's a year or two off in between where you, where you worked in a profession that is going to be applicable to what you're going to do in a law firm, or you come in and you've really set your, your mind to, hey, I want to be an IP specialist, or I want to be an emerging company specialist, and to take advantage of what, of what Santa Clara has to offer, uh, I think you're very, very well positioned. But, but, and I'm also not here to say that everybody should know exactly what they want to do. You're taught primarily litigation for the first year. I talked to a lot of very talented law students who, who are quite honest. I don't know what I want to do. That's what I want to use the summer for. If that's the case, be strategic during the summer. Take a hard look at both sides if you're in a program that allows you to do that. And, and, and really set your sights. Come back in the third year and say, okay, I now know what I want to do. I know where I'm going to do it. I'm going to make myself a better first year lawyer. And I'm, I'm not going to coast through my third year. I'm going to become a better, a better lawyer. So Mark talked about curricular activities on a small <coughs> side, besides molding that curriculum, and I don't know, you can talk about whether that's important for you also on the small firm side, but what other types of experiences might you be looking for as well? Yeah, I, I guess my, my personal advice to you is to select things that you like, because things that you like, you will be more interested in and you will do better at Your law career search started when you took you know, the LSAT. So it's not going to start after you pass the bar. So network with people here. You're going to be working with, for them, um, next to them, with them, referring back and forth. These, this, is, this is networking. This is it um, for you now. And also, um, in terms of weaving together maybe a story of you so that you can stand out. I can only speak for myself. I became a lawyer. I have no other lawyers in my family. Um, it was hard for me to figure out what a lawyer was, much less what a business or tax attorney is. So as I moved into the point in my career of trying to develop my own practice and thinking about my own business plan and things like that, what's the story I'm going to tell the clients? Well, I come from a family of small businesses. All my family owner, all my family is entrepreneurs. That actually is something I bring to the table, which is an empathy um, and an understanding of what it's like to run a business. And so that became something that I could build upon. And I think all of you do have things you can build upon. All of I have three boys. They all swim on a competitive swim team. Okay, I spend tons of time at swim meets on the weekend. That really detracts, or I used to view that as a detraction from building my practice. Other people are out playing golf and getting clients and I'm helping my kids swim meet. No. So now I serve on the board of that swim team, you know, now in between events and talking to other parents. And so you can make your life work in that way. And if you end up taking four years to do law school instead of three, but you build in, you know, an internship or a volunteer or whatever that thing is that you want to do, um, 
you know, if you're going to be doing estates and trusts and you can, you know, volunteer and help people um, in the elderly community and then sign up for that elder law class and, you know, put your story together and sort of form yourself and, and do that now. And I'm sorry that you have to do that in addition to your studies because I know that's really demanding. Um, but you, you do. So, Steve, both Mark and Catherine mentioned essentially the idea of personal branding as a candidate. As someone who works with candidates and helps them to um, go out onto the market, how do you help someone build a brand? Um, get any experience you can. <coughs> and, uh, I think that whenever I speak on these panels, I think there's uh, some assumption that there's, you know, there's a certain number of people here that probably um, are already on the track to go to a large firm and, and do some of the things that have been discussed when everybody else, I was in that second, well, well I'm just gonna, I, I need to find a job. I need to, I, 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 I wouldn't get a look from large firms that I either didn't have a GPA or do well on on-campus interviews or whatever the reason is. Um, so I think for for everyone else, and that, like I mentioned, that was a group I was in, um, it's to try to get someone's foot at the door. Um, and it can still be a large firm. Uh, I, I do staff placement as well. Sometimes I've had people that have graduated from school, they're waiting on bar results, um, haven't had luck getting interviews. I'll send them out and do a temp paralegal job. I actually had a young woman get uh, an associate position at a national firm because two summers in a row I had her working as a receptionist there. Um, and she probably wouldn't have gotten a look based on her resume, but every day they're walking by her desk talking to her, oh, you're in law school, so what are you studying? Uh, they got to know her, thought she'd be a, a good talent for the firm when she graduated and passed the bar, they hired her as an associate. Now, that doesn't happen all the time from a temp job, uh, but I think that it's important to do anything you can uh, to get out there, get some professional experience, even if it's not attorney level work. Um, there is, uh, there's doc review. There are, um, if you've had a previous career uh, in a corporation, get out there and maybe, you know, if you've been a contracts administrator, do some work doing that type of work. Anything you can do is going to help you build your personal brand. Because when you're talking about building a personal brand professionally, it's what experiences do you have, what do you know how to do. Um, and that gets back to the big discussion we had earlier about it's, it's all an economic question. It's not just a profession, it's a business. If someone's going to hire you, what do you bring to the table? Um, that is going to reward them hiring you. So. It's sort of to that point, I, I, I remember when I was going through this process 30 years ago, there was always the question, well, uh, after your first year of law school, do you do you go do something non-law related? It's the last time you're ever going to be able to do anything. I think that there's been a total shift in that. Yeah. I think that that it doesn't necessarily have to be law, but it ought to be professional, and, and it, it could be it, it could be an industry type of an internship uh, that is outside the legal profession. But I, I think you don't want to, to my mind, you don't want to have that gap now after your first year. And I know those, hard, those are hard, certainly in a paying capacity within law, those are much harder to come by. But I think there are a lot of people out there who are looking for, for clerk help at either low or you know, no paying positions, externships and the like. I, I, I mean, one thing I do is I, I sort of track the school and employment history right up to the present. And I, I don't think I would want to see that gap anymore in, in a non-law uh, position after a first year. Another shift that you mentioned that um, I can remember is, I can remember being at a point where in career services we really talked about the two summers worth of experience, and we talk about more than that now in career services. And Mark, you said on the phone that you couldn't, that you couldn't st overstate how important getting a lot of practical experience is to you. So, how much practical experience? Do you need to have more than the two summers worth of experience? I, 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 I don't think, I mean, I, look, I know the pressures, so I wouldn't say you have to have an in-school in school term externship. Sure, if you get it, those are all enhancements, and it just goes to the point about showing up with a case that's going to distinguish yourself from somebody who hasn't done any of that. Now, at the end of the day, we're going to make a decision based on a lot of factors, but I think you've got a, you've got a leg up in that. I think the, the clinical stuff you can do here, I will also, I'll make a pitch. Uh, which I may have done on the phone about writing. I, I and I've told this story. I sit there and I, I'm the one who ultimately determines which of our summers are going to get offers and which aren't. The vast majority do, and yet, if there's a common uh, constructive critique, it's that the writing could be better. And so, put yourselves in a position where you can get at bats on writing, whether it's a journal. I, I don't know what they are all down here specifically, but that is going. That is going to be a huge distinction. 
to you if you had come out of your summer and you're getting you know, plaudits for being a great writer. Do whatever you can to work with professors down here, maybe even on a, on a you know, sort of an off-track off basis to, hey, can I, can I write something for you? Give me a good look at it because it's, it's just absolutely important. And I think that social media, Twitter, Facebook, email, text, I think that has tended to have degraded our, our, our writing ability. I think there's an, there's an aspect of informality to it. Well, guess what? The judge isn't interested in LOL and FWIW, right? They, they, want, they want cogent arguments, well-written, concise, well-cited. So it still matters. If you're writing contracts, it matters where a comma goes. It matters where a semicolon goes. So I just think you, you, will, you will definitely set yourself apart if the partners in my firm are talking about the other summer saying that person really knows how to write. We've also had <coughs> another paradigm shift in career services that we talk about a lot in counseling students, and that has to do with soft skills, the term soft skills. Um, Catherine, you're, you're not in your head. Yeah. Can you define what a soft skill is, what soft skills are, and, and what that means for you as someone who might sit in the capacity of being a legal employer and why that's important? Don't use that term, but I assume you mean um, people, you know, people <coughs> skills and technology skills and research skills and that sort of thing. Um, this is a service business, and uh, I won't repeat the writing issue, but it is probably primary. Secondary or equal is your interpersonal skills um, because you have to get along with the clients. Um, they don't often speak English, but we have to be able to speak English. Um, and your colleagues and everything else. And it, it, the politics um, or office demeanor, I think, can be difficult if you haven't been in that environment, whether it's trying to interact with the secretary without having her bark at you mm -hmm. or trying to get um, the partner who's giving you an assignment to speak English. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, it's, it's really hard uh, as it is. So anything you can do to get those one-on-one -on -one communication skills down ask good questions, ask all your questions at the same time, um, you know, write them down, um, befriending people in the office, you're going to need some allies, and whether it's, you know, somebody who's a year or two ahead of you, or um, the one other female partner, or, you know, whoever that may be, um, that can help you um, maneuver through that landmine. But my favorite people to work with are the bright people who are better than me and everything, who can make me look good, and who can um, who can compliment me. I'm good at certain things and not at other things. So when I go looking for an associate to work for me or a paralegal to work for me, I'm looking for somebody to compliment me, actually. I'm looking for somebody to outshine me. And so um, I love hiring younger people. Um, I feel like I'm young, but then, you know, I'm actually one of the younger people. <laughs> but um, when I go out, I, you know, I am dated, and I find that students, um, hiring students in the summer, they can research, you know, so much faster. They can find, you know, all these things. They find these free programs to do these things that they take me, you know, two hours, and you know, and they completely dazzle me. And that that adds so much value. So can you talk about how you demonstrate this? Because you're not going to write on your resume something like. I like people and people like me. Oh, I've seen that before. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen that before. Um, all things being equal, if I have two candidates interviewing for a position at, at an employer, and they have similar backgrounds, um, similar experience, the employer is going to hire the person they like the best. Why? Because they have to work with them every day. Um, but also, too, because going back again to our original dis discussion about this being business, um, if you have that kind of emotional intelligence, people call it, you're going to be a better. Um, you're going to be better at building business for your organization, whether it's a law firm or uh, another type of professional services firm or uh, a large corporation or a small mom and pop shop business. Um, people tend to do business with people who understand you and who are empathetic. And um, I think that um, the soft skills that you mentioned um, really come into play when you're when you're building business. I'm sure that the other panelists have sat across from a potential client ultimately earn that business, not just because they were very smart and had smart people working for them who were going to provide good legal services, but because they really connected with them on a personal level too, knowing that 
they could pick up the phone and call one of them and they would understand their problems, not just from a legal standpoint, but as a human being. So uh, I think that it comes into play in, in every situation. When I sit down with a, an outstanding candidate on paper, um, if they are also um, just a, a, a nice person, um, uh, understanding, thoughtful, good listener, that makes them uh, even better candidate. If I sit down with someone who has a mediocre resume, but there's, they have all those other you know, personal skills, um, they can still go out there and get a job because people are going to like them a lot and may overlook some of their technical deficiencies and say, well, we can train them on that. But you can't train somebody to have you know, that emotional intelligence. You know, I, I don't know whether you're seeing it or even training for it, but, and I think Cooley's a little bit maybe even late, late for the train on this one, but this notion of behavioral interviewing, mm -hmm. which I think is, is, has been used in the, in the consulting firm world for a long time, uh, it's making its way into the law firm recruiting effort where, where firms, and, and we did this just in the last three, four weeks, have definitively defined what are the, they call them their core competencies. And, and I think, I'm not sure whether they're soft or they're intangible, but they're going to vary probably a little bit from firm to firm. Uh, but we, we interview them and we assign, so we've got eight of them. If we see a candidate, I saw a candidate this morning who was going to see five or six people, those interviewers are assigned a competency. And their, one of their goals in 30 minutes is to ferret out whether that person can, can in fact display or, or demonstrate that competency. And they might range from as simple as literally intelligence, you know, is, is, and he wouldn't be there if you had failed that one probably on campus, to communication skills, both written and oral, initiative, motivation. We're huge on team play and esprit de corps. Are we looking at, do we see anything on a resume, a, a team, a debate team, a sports team, that, that would suggest you know, this person knows how to get along with others, and if they, even more than that, if they've been a captain, they, they know how to lead and they know how to inspire. So those are the types of things, again, whether you would call them soft, maybe they are, but at the end of the day, they're actually really important. And we've been seeing, I would say, oh, for the past two years, almost uniformity with all of the on-campus yeah. interviewers coming on and having this portion of their interviews be behavioral interview questions. And I think the other thing that we've seen is a movement away from what was a very casual type of interview style before, which had questions like, who are you, why do you enjoy coming to law school, what do you like most about your experience to, tell me exactly why you're interested in our firm, what you hope to accomplish there, what practice area you want to be in, and then this probing on these core competencies. Yeah, they're not, you know, we, we don't try to pull it out of the blue. We know what our companies are. We are really looking at the resume my view is you better be able to defend your entire resume. So if you've got it on there, you better have a reason and you better be able to talk about it. Whether it's your thesis from undergrad, you better still be able to remember it. And if it's, and if it's, so I take it for granted that if it's on there, you're proud of it and you want to talk about it. And that's where I try to find my, my, court, my um, behavioral interviewing questions. I'm not, these aren't pie in the sky hypotheticals. It's let's talk about your leadership as captain of the water polo team. What, what successes, what failures, what would you have been done differently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. this is exactly what we're seeing. Looking a little bit into the crystal ball and gazing into that, and Steve, why don't we start with you? What, what do you see in the near future? Uh, continued recovery in, in the market. I think that um, when you look at both uh, the legal field and the, the economy, the national economy at large, you see that there's this gradual improvement. We're kind of marking time, there's not a lot of significant improvement. Uh, the job reports come out every month and it's positive job growth, but not really enough to move the unemployment rate. Um, I, I think what I'm seeing on a micro level is that the same small group of people are getting all the job offers. Um, in, in an economy like this, and even if the economy is good, there are certain skills that are just always in demand and there are um, a shortage of people who can do them. Um, and so you're seeing uh, kind of a, a dual uh, employment economy, we have the all-stars that are getting all the job offers, and then everybody else is kind of scrambling to find a place for themselves. And, you know, that can be that they have um, certain technical backgrounds that um, come into play very well here in Silicon Valley, people with IP backgrounds, as I mentioned, hard science backgrounds before. Um, there are just some uh, types of positions, some types of training that not many people have. Um, you know, uh, one of the things that I see a huge demand for, uh, even if they don't have a hard science background, anybody with any patent experience, patent isn't um, an area where people get pulled into formal training often. Um, you know, when you 
um, join a large firm often in the corporate relationship. Um, so the, there are some structural reasons why certain jobs um, you know, don't have enough applicants. And you, you kind of hear that that disconnect when you read an article that says, you know, HR people say they can't find enough good good candidates. Well, what they can't find uh, enough of are certain skill sets, and it's. For the reasons I mentioned, maybe it's difficult to get that skill set. Maybe there's no way that um, someone can get it unless they're either lucky or they have uh, a mentor that can teach them that skill set. So, um, but I see gradual improvement. Um, I think that what I've seen in the last six months to a year is that a lot of those those difficult to find people are getting snapped up. So now that sometimes organizations have to fall back to the next tier of well, they're not absolute all stars, but they're pretty darn good. <coughs> so people, maybe we can train them a little bit. I'm starting to hear the training. Well, we can work with what they have. Um, they don't have to have all ten of these things to get the job. If they have eight, we'll, we'll figure out what the other two are and still bring them on board. So I think that as the economy gets better, you're going to see kind of the bar lower for people that um, you know are hard. Catherine, what do you come down to face? I was hoping you weren't going to ask me that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I, I really, I really can't say. Um, the changes that happen in my firm happen the client level primarily. So as business makes demands, we adapt to that, you know, as soon as we can. Um, I, I can't really, it's uh, it's been tough. What are some of the client demands that you've seen? Um, yeah, that's fair enough. Um, the clients um, shop attorneys more than they used to, in more like the way you shop when you compare for products online. Um, and they need um, quicker results. So I work for what used to be a lifestyle firm, um, and I made less. I had a less billable hour requirement. Um, I worked for partners that had kids and valued that family life and that sort of thing. And the firm environment that I work in is actually still the same. I'm not receiving more pressure from partners or colleagues. I receive more pressure from clients. Um, I know that if I don't get that done um, over the weekend, uh, that they can find an attorney in Google. So, um, so I carry my BlackBerry even though it's not required. If I worked in a larger firm, that might be required. But it, it's, now it kind of doesn't matter if I work in a large firm or a small firm. I still have to do it because <laughs> the business world is demanding that. Um, and. Uh, the other is pretty much the same um, that it's always been, which is just that as a business attorney, you have to you have to get the right answer. You know, the answer is always yes. <laughs> Can we do this bizarre odd uh, thing? The answer is absolutely. You can do that, and absolutely, I can help you do that. Unfortunately, we might have to bail you out of jail, but you know, <laughs> but, um, but that's the nature of business. And in terms of other areas of law, I can't imagine it's that different. Um, you, you have to be able to deliver what the client needs. Mark, what do you see in the future? Yeah, so you know, not to talk out of those sides of my mouth, because I said earlier we are hiring, but I, I, I would say we are hiring more toward um, current demand as opposed to getting too far out in front. Whereas in the past, we probably could have counted on given the robustness of the economy, we could get out on the lead a little bit and be comfortable that the work is going to come to keep all these people busy. I, I, I'd say we're a little more conservative, and, and for instance, as we construct summer classes, I, I, I'd rather come up short right now by a couple head count than be over by five or six or 10 people, because that might, depending on the office and the, and the department, that might create a problem for me. I think the you know in our in our big firm world, I think what's pretty clear too is you there's there's continuing separation of the firms that are doing quite well despite the economy and those that are not doing as well. So you're you're getting this divide whether you call it the have or have nots, whether that's appropriate or not. But a, a clearer and maybe even bigger distinction between those that are I'll, I'll say the word loosely thriving and those that are that are that are definitely struggling. And I we're thankfully on the doing well, so that's why we're hiring. Oh, fantastic. I want to leave some time for questions and answers and open up the floor to those of you that are sitting here <coughs> to ask those questions. So um, let me do that right now. Yes. 
Does it help you to start looking for your for a job in a small town with the intention of moving into a larger town later? Oh. Yeah, I, 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 it's funny. I sort of I, I wrote a note to myself about geography. I, I think it's one of those things you have to you have to put out there as you begin to try to define where it is you want to be and what you want to do. And, and it may be, and I, I thought that because I was reading a, a bank report today, and they, they will tell us what regions are doing better. So it's not so much small towns, but right now, Texas is a very robust uh, legal market. The Southwest is doing pretty well. Um, there are other areas that aren't doing so well. Now, if you're sitting here as a first year, it's kind of hard to say, okay, based on that data, I'm gonna look at Chicago in three years. You know, it's a flip of the coin, but I do think you have to at least put that aspect out there in terms of, uh, you know, do I want to be here in Santa Clara where my, my JD is going to really travel well and I've got, you know, an alumni network that's unbelievable. Well, their Santa Clara network it goes well beyond California too. So I think it's, I think it's a really good question and, and I wouldn't take geography. Now, of course, the employer is going to say, all right, you're from here and you want to be here. What possible connection do you have to that? Why? Why do I believe you're invested in being in this area? You just have to have an answer for that. And it might be just as honest to say, look, I, I want to get started. This is, this is a robust, robust market. I want to be part of that. And I've, I've, I've shifted my classwork and whatever else to prove that this is where I want to be, both the firm and the geography. Steve, you might have some thoughts on that. No, I think that if, let's say you're in a small town um, and you're wondering, well, do I stay here in the Bay Area, go back to my small town, wherever, I, I would guess if you really want to live in wherever you came from, uh, there's probably less competition if it's not as much of a, a large metro area. I see a lot of graduates that had trouble finding jobs in major metro areas go back to wherever they live, a smaller city, even a small town, and, and have quite a bit of luck finding a leadership job. There are, you know, we're talking, instead of thousands of same job, you have a dozen. Yes, back on the back row. Um, my question was, do you guys suggest applying directly to firms for summer field trips? Or is that, I mean, do you guys hire an OCI, or is that something that you guys yeah. I can talk from our perspective. I, I, I think it's, it's harder to do it direct. I mean, if you really catch our eye, it might be the perfect way to come in. But we we tend to do most of our our through the OCI sign up process and lotteries, etc. Uh, that's not to say that if you you know if you don't get on our schedule, um, you shouldn't make that that effort or at least wait. Listen, I, and I I speak from experience. I was waitlisted at Cooley 29 years ago here, and I got 15 minutes on campus. And 30 years later, I'm here telling you about the firm. So, so you know, dig in. If that's the one you want, you, you got to take whatever shot you can get. But I will tell you, predominantly, we will take from our sign-ups. Well, predominantly, we take from relationships. You know, if we, if we hire, um, an email goes out in the firm, does anybody know anybody who can know anybody who can do this? Um, otherwise, um, I would say we did have one attorney not too long ago who targeted our firm. They wanted to work there. And um, on the second round, they were successful. It's an adorable story, but um, <laughs> they were a client, actually. And um, then uh, years later, they were this, a trust and estates client. And then years later, they went to law school and they contacted the trust and estates attorney that had been their attorney. And you know, it was awkward situation, right? Because that attorney's trying to be nice to a client, but like, no. Um, but, um, you know, then afterwards, you know, she just kept saying, this is where I want to be. I really respect this firm. I really like this firm. I'll do anything. Come on. And, and we hired her, and uh, she was great. So um, if you see a bio or you see something in a small firm that's particularly attractive to you, and you can say, you know, that's exactly what I want to do. Please let me in the door. You know, can I answer the phone for you? Can I work for you in the summer? You know, what have you? Um, for a smaller firm, that is going to be more effective because we may not be on campus interviewing. The other thing I was thinking about your, your question. One hook, of course, is if you know people who have worked at the firm in the prior summer, and there's a real relationship there because there's nothing better if 
you know, if, if Sarah Taylor said, hey, I, I know this person, they didn't get on the schedule, they're really worth taking a look at, I would, you know, I wouldn't overplay that because I wouldn't want to put pressure on a friend and to sort of oversell. The other thing is you've got, you've got lawyers from other law firms that come teach here. That's another pretty good hook. When that partner can come back and say, X, Y, Z didn't get on your schedule, I can tell you I've seen her in action, I've seen her work, it's probably really worth taking a look at. Steve, what are some of the tips and tricks you share with clients? Uh, don't underestimate your own network. Um, I think that uh, with LinkedIn and other social networking sites, uh, who you know right off the top of your head might not be who's really in your network. I've had someone come and sit in front of me they were really frustrated. They couldn't get um, an interview with uh, actually a pretty reputable uh, regional firm here in the Bay Area. And I said, well, you know, who do you know? Well, I don't know anybody. My parents do this. They're in a completely different industry. Well, it turns out her dad was actually one of the biggest clients of this firm, and she didn't even know it. Um, so, you know, it, she did get it. Oh, I can tell you, we hate those. Oh, you know, I, I knew the eyes were going to be rolling, but she still got an interview. Um, she did a different job. But uh, I, I do think that um, you, you do have to if you're left to kind of what I call a guerrilla job search, when you just have to get a foot in the door somehow, don't underestimate your own network. Uh, I think that, and there are proper ways of doing it. I, I don't think you want to you know, take advantage of people, push them too hard, because I, I get that a lot too. I mean, I'll have clients say, hey, can you interview you know, my nephew? And I, you know, send me the nephew's resume. I'd be like, well, it's not much I can do, but I'll try to add some value for them. Um, you know, we don't always love to do the favor interview, but you know, people will do it, and, and you never know. Uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes, Fortunate situations come out of something that was uh, far-fetched or you know, kind of a, a long shot when it, when it came up. So I think that um, my advice is to do anything you can. I mean, I, I give the obvious advice to you know use the network. Santa Clara has a great network here. Social networking, blah blah blah, knocking on doors. But there are some other techniques that I, I find uh, useful. And I think that really taking a look at um, LinkedIn, who your connections are, who their connections are. So not a, you, you can turn off. Uh, I mean, the ability for people to see your connections, but a lot of people don't. Um, you'll be surprised at who is maybe you know, one or two steps away from you um, that you might be able to call and say, hey, you know what, um, I'm a friend of so-and-so who you know, works with you. Uh, I have just like five minutes of your time to, I thought you might be able to help with my search. I think if you approach people respectfully and um, respect their time, um, and uh, they're more likely to, to shoot you an email or, or give you a phone call. In the interest of time, we'll take one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, with companies like LegalZoom, do you guys see that as a bad or an upcoming trend? Catherine, you talked about that on the phone. Well, that's definitely an upcoming trend. You know, it's, it's, I don't know if it's a trend. It's, a, it's here. It's a presence. It's here. What specifically? Well, how do you think that's changing your firm's uh, hiring style or just client relationship? Um, I say bring it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's working for me because um, we don't make a lot of money on big corporations. Um, we do in corporations to meet a client and to gain a long-term relationship and we hope we don't lose money. Um, uh, after that, uh, so the legal team people get to a certain point in their, or not legal team, the people who use legal team get to a certain point in their business and made it that far, they're going to need legal um, assistance, and so I just need to nab them at a different point in their business cycle, and then there's even more work to do because it was done wrong. Yeah, as a small business owner, I will say, I did my own LLC when I formed my company, but you know, as I got into some employment issues, I, I called an, an actual attorney to get some advice because you do realize that there's only so much you can do on a self-help basis, and there are some things that you can put together, the forms are pretty good, they're pretty harmless even if you make small errors, but other things are critical in your business, yeah. your personal life. You want to really have someone you're talking about. Um, it's worth paying a few hundred bucks to sit down and just get a consultation. I want to thank our panelists for being here. And